Um, in a very tiny font here, I have a haiku courtesy of Lindsay Cooper, an intern who worked for us for Mozilla. It's somewhat beautiful and describes Rustle's succinctly in a way, a systems language pursuing the trifecta, safe, concurrent, fast. It's a very elegant way of putting things. Here, here's another way of putting it that's not quite so elegant, but I think gets the point even more so. Russ is like C++ grew up and went to grad school. She has an office with Erlang and is dating SML. So that summarizes in a lot of ways the feature set we're looking at here. Russ is a language that offers stack allocation, precise control of your memory layout. It has a generic system, um, but it uses monomorphization to get efficient execution of them. From Erlang, it inherits safe task concurrency, or rather it's inspired by Erlang to have safe task-based concurrency and a notion of task failure. Um, and from SML, it has type safety and type classes sort of come from Haskell. I was tempted to put um, Haskell in parentheses there, but I decided to stay true to the original quote. And the destructuring bind, everybody has destructuring bind nowadays, right? Why, why wouldn't you have that? Even, even ES6 is gonna have it. Um, so, Having given you the overview of the sort of big picture of what Rust offers, a lot of people say, what the heck is Mozilla doing? Why are you spending time on a new programming language? And it's a really great question. It didn't make any sense to me either when I was first talking to Mozilla about coming and working with them. And it's actually a really simple answer in the end. Web browsers are really complex. They are effectively um, operating systems in a their own little sandbox. And they have to deal with this crazy security model, they have to deal with the network, they have to have high performance nowadays with the kinds of apps you see. So they're really complex, and meanwhile, Mozilla has to, for its mission, continue having a user base, and that means that we have to be competitive in the marketplace, but at the same time, we want to innovate, we want to provide better experiences for our users. And so you gotta be competitive, in terms of performance, but you gotta innovate as well. And it's really hard to do both atop the standard systems languages that are out there, C and C++. So, Mozilla Research, to implement their next-gen uh, web browser called Servo, which this source code is out there on the web for, you can see it yourself. Mozilla is using and implementing the language Rust, which is this website. You'll see it again at the end. So, that's the motivation for what's going on here. Now I'm going to dive in and show you a bit of Rust syntax and semantics. I have to admit, uh, I've seen the talks yesterday and today. I've realized most of you, this will be bog standard for most of you. Um, so I'm going to go quickly through these slides and um, just you know, try to get to the fun, meaty stuff at the end further on. So um, our goal here is to bridge the performance gap between safe and unsafe languages. And the design twists we made largely fell out of that requirement. There's some things that don't quite match up with typical FP style things, but you know, there's usually a good reason for it. Uh, the compiler, and also just so you know, the compiler standard library tools are all licensed under Apache, dual, dual licensed under uh, MIT and Apache. So it's a language for systems programming, C and C++ dominate this space. And the systems programmers, you know, when I was in undergrad, the teachers all said, ah, I don't care about the, you know, the five and 10% of performance. You know, change your algorithm, get the 2x speed up from, or you know, 10x or better speed up from changing your algorithm. But serious system programmers, they want both. <laughs> they want to have the right algorithm and get that last 10, 15% performance that they can get out of really tight controls. So they use C to get that kind of thing, C and C++, but there's lots of unsafe aspects to C and C++. Um, Obviously, we, we've all had these horror stories. Um, and we want to try to attack these things. So a tool for this is uh, sound type checking. There's a great quote from Robin Milner, well-typed programs can't go wrong. Um, but I don't think that quote really properly conveys what was really going on. Or rather, Milner, as he originally said, had you know capital W wrong. And it was a formal notion of a certain class of error called going wrong. There were other errors that might happen that just weren't called going wrong. So the point here is that a type system can help you identify a certain class of errors, you can isolate them, and that's good. It helps a lot. It helps you 
reason to buy your program, helps you have more confidence that it actually might do what you think it does. And so, um, during my graduate studies, I came to realize that there's a perhaps more appropriate phrase here. This isn't the exact phrase that Wadler coined, um, but well-typed programs help you assign blame. There's going to be unsafe components in any real system. And the idea of a type system is to help you figure out who actually is at fault. In a completely type safe language, if something goes wrong, you see a crash, well, then maybe you have a compiler bug, or maybe your runtime libraries have a problem, or there's an FFI issue. They really do help you isolate what might have been the issue. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, there's this notion of going wrong in terms of uh, crazy system crashes. There's also other kinds of errors, and safe code can have those kinds of errors. What we, and what you want to do there is to have them fail in a controlled fashion. This is nothing new to the Erlang cult in terms of you know, having a sensible response to failure conditions and just isolating it to a task and then having some sort of um, semantics for how it affects other tasks. Okay, another detail is that C is very popular because there is a pretty easy correspondence between the code that you write and what the machine actually does. The, you know, the actual layout of memory, the actual instructions you get when you disassemble a C routine and then you look at the original source code and you're like, oh, yeah, okay. And that, that, there's often times a correspondence that makes things easier to work with when you're trying to deal with that low-level stuff. And um, programmers like to be able to control those low-level details and we want to preserve that relationship ourselves. But we want to retain memory safety. So we want to ensure that um, the type system can actually make reasonable uh, inferences about what the program is doing. And we also don't want runtime cost. That's the big one that's really tough. Um, there's a quote here, there's a great blog post by uh, Robert O'Callaghan, and he coins a phrase in it, or he uses a phrase at least, zero cost abstractions. It talks about, for example, the abstraction of um, factoring out a function in your system into a separate routine. And there's a, there is a cost to doing that. If you actually do that and, you, and your system doesn't re-inline it, then you know, there's a function call overhead and there's some in compiler analysis that you might have lost out on. On the other hand, maybe your code is smaller because you factored that out. There's a trade-off involved. And in any case, it's a good idea in a systems programming language to provide some abstractions where you can say, this abstraction provides no cost at runtime over what you would have written otherwise. So inline functions are an example of that. That's something where you can just say, look, it's going to go back to being what you had originally. This is just a better uh, modularity mechanism for structuring your code. Also, in, uh, in programs, you know, when I talk about zero cost abstractions, I'm talking about the runtime cost. But the abstractions that we have in Rust, oftentimes there's a huge cognitive overhead in terms of how you have to think about things. And that's just like when you're doing systems programming. You know, you have to think about your data representation, you have to make choices about how you're going to lay out your memory, whether it's going to be stack allocated or heap allocated, whether you're going to have objects in line and other objects, that sort of thing. But at least in the safe parts of your code, the compiler will check all of your assumptions and really ensure that you do not violate the decisions that you've actually made, that everything actually makes sense within the safe blocks. Okay, so let's dive in and see some Rust. So I'm going to just, you know, jump right in here. Um, for this crowd, great, expression-oriented. That makes a heck of a lot of sense for functional programmers. So you know you can add things and compare them, and you can bind. This is a binding let expression that returns the result of x greater than five. Um, you have more complicated things. We've got if expressions. And, you know that's just another let expression there. Um, and then you've got function definition and invocation. Uh, uh, this is a slight lie here. This fn add three. That's not an expression. That's actually a function definition. It's a standalone item on its own, but we'll get to closures. We've got them. Um, the real point here is I just wanted to show you, you know, invoking functions in that context. Here you go, find the result. But the thing is that we want to appeal to C and C++ programmers. And, you know, I love expression-oriented stuff, but not everyone does. So if you want to be statement-oriented, you can be. We've got a structure for things where basically the same code that I wrote up there, or yeah, up there, this is the corresponding code using return statements. Some people see it as more verbose, other people see it as, see it as being clear as to what's actually going on. Okay, so, um, 
we've got macros. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, except just to point out that um, our convention in, for macro invocation in Rust is to write them with, it's not a convention, it's a rule. Um, they have an exclamation point at the end of the name, and then there's stuff in the parentheses. I'm not going to get into the details of the parser and how it works to actually make these things work out, except to say that one is that you know, we're putting this exclamation point at the end, and that eases lexical analysis for simple-minded, we'll, we'll say programming tools. Um, so the point here is that there's a couple of macros that I'm going to use in the talk, and the int most interesting one really is print line, where unlike the C printf statement, um, we actually have static checking of your template string to make sure it corresponds to the arguments that you provide. And I don't mean just in terms of the number of arguments. I mean that the types are compatible for the uh, specifier that you used. I'll admit this, uh, this curly colon D syntax struck me as a little weird when I first saw it. Um, but the reason for it is that it's, um, it's better for internationalization than printf style for set sign stuff in terms of being more flexible in how you actually uh, mix and match your arguments for different languages that you're deploying on. And the other thing I want to mention, uh, the colon question mark down here for fail, that's a, uh, a very special thing in Rust in that the other styles of printf things, um, well, well, this like prints out a decimal that it gets out, but the, 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 the colon D there, but the colon question mark, there's basically a, uh, enough metadata that we admit in our compiled code that we'll get nice printouts of the layout of your structures, which, you know, for someone coming from Lisp, it's like, of course you want that. Why, why wouldn't you want your data to be printed out nicely? But when I was programming C and C++, I really missed this kind of thing. So it was a joy to have it back again in the context. And I'm not going to talk about user-defined macros. We have them, except uh, they're not. They're like one of these things that a feature that may change after we do 1.0. And so um, they're not something that's guaranteed back as compatible when we have our 1.0 release right now. We haven't released 1.0 yet. Yeah, that's coming soon. Um, so. Mutability, local state is immutable by, by default. We all know this is a great idea. I'm not going <laughs> to belabor that. Um, C enum, the enum syntax looks a lot like C enums, except uh, we use a match statement to do dispatch. And also that just because we call them enums, oh, yeah, OK, our match statements, we have the typical kinds of things here. You have to have your types make sense. And you have to make sure that the cases are exhausted in your match typical stuff. But the other thing is that we're using the word enum, but we really mean algebraic data. You can attach values to these things, to the cases involved. So the way it tricks C programmers into like getting into doing algebraic data oriented programming by first writing enums without this stuff, and then they find out about this. Um, so we have destructure and bind. It's the same match clause I just showed you. Here we're just binding n for the one case and x and y for the two case, and then doing some computation on them. Structured data. So we have something similar to struct in C. Lays out the memory, the fields in memory in order of declaration, and according to what sizes they have, and you know, obeying whatever alignment constraints you need to obey. And aliveness analysis ensures that you actually initialize your fields um, before using them. So you're not going to get uninitialized data off your stack because the compiler can force you to actually provide initialization. So here's just the syntax for this, but this is all pretty straightforward. Um, a struct pair having two integer fields. The initialization syntax here, we create a pair. This is going to be stack allocated um, with bindings for, with, with the you know, x field filled in the value 3 and the y field getting the value 4. And then here's our record extension syntax. So if you want to create a different a copy of a record or a struct with just one field change, this is the syntax for that. It's one of those things where a functional programming person, I think, really grooves on this. But I suspect other people might. Um, not even know it's there and end up writing out all their fields all the time because they don't know about it, which would make me a little sad, but um, that's life. Um, we have closures. So first of all, we have C style function pointers, you know, just a word pointing to some function, um, either a Rust function or a C function. But also we have closures that you can pass around so that you can actually capture um, parts of your environment. The syntax for them is inspired by Ruby blocks. So here's some code. I would create a structured pair here, let p34 equal the pair 3 and 4. Our closure syntax, we've got um, those vertical bars for new x, and then we've got it creating a new pair from p34. So we can see that p34 is part of our environment, and then we're just closing over it. And so here I created two different x adjusters, one that inserts one for the value for the x thing, and 
one inserts two for the value of the x. And then here I have a sample use of that print line that I was talking about with the fun um, the colon question mark. So you actually run this, you get printouts of things of this format. Um, and like I said, you don't have to write the output routines for colon question mark. The metadata is just there for you already. But if you want to write your own format routines for other format specifiers, uh, go to it. Okay, so what about object oriented programming? Because um, that's important, right? And it's true, it is important, it's an important paradigm. And Rust does have uh, object oriented programming that has methods and interfaces. But in order to explain them, I have to first explain pointers in Rust. So, a Rust pointer, um, the type of it is, for, there's, a, there's a bunch of different kinds of pointers in Rust. And the one I'm going to be talking about for the most part during this early part of the talk is what's called a borrow pointer. It's meant to be represent um, a pointer to some own portion of memory. And the syntax for it is ampersand and then the type of the memory that you're borrowing. So here, we're borrowing a reference to the value, to the field x on the stack. We're binding that to y. And then we dereference with the star operator, just like you can see. And if you try to actually do things like compare pointers to integers, it doesn't make any sense. So it doesn't type check. Um, pointers, if you're going to actually mutate state via a pointer, well, there's two places where you have to declare the mutability um, explicitly. The reason we do this is because um, people misunderstanding what state is mutable is a common source of bugs. So we're forcing them to actually write that X is a mutable field and also write at the point where they borrow it that they're taking it mutably. This also ties into our uh, borrow checking analysis that I'll be talking a little bit about later, or at least alluding to it. So here, this code here, we have an increment function that takes in a pointer and says, I take in something that's a pointer, to, a mutable pointer to an int, and the static type system is going to, in the borrow checker, is going to ensure that there are no aliases of this pointer in terms of there can only be one reference to that piece of memory within this task, and thus you get um, guarantees of non-aliasing that are pretty useful for reasoning about code. Okay, so like I said, there's, there's different kinds of pointers in memory in Rust. The three big cases that are sort of built into the design of the language, at least in my head, there's stack allocated local memory that we've already seen, and you can take references to that via the ampersand pointer. There's an exchange heap where you also have owned memory. So the notion here is that a task owns the memory on its stack. It also owns memory that is allocated on an exchange heap. Um, and, but the idea of that kind of memory is that there is one owning pointer of the memory of, on the exchange heap. This task can't have more than one owning pointer of it. And if there are borrow pointers into it, they all have lifetimes that are, that are um, bounded by the lifetime of the owning pointer. So, that's a restriction. Own memory has to have one single owning pointer. Also, it's, it's also known as a you know, kind of linear type style system or affine type, depending on your point of view in this case. So some programs are hard to write that way. We acknowledge that. And so um, if you need to have more than one pointer to a piece of data, then you have to use some sort of automatically memory managed um, memory. And that's the managed heap. But the important thing here, and this is, ties in very well with Erlang style, or design decisions, is that the managed heap for the GC or you know, reference counter heap, however it's managed, it's only for that one task. And we enforce that, you know, the, the, those references cannot leak out to other tasks. And, and if you borrow memory from the GC heap, those can't leak out to other tasks either. Um, okay, so that's sort of interesting. And in case you didn't infer it, the reason why own memory is interesting and you know, different from intra-task memory is the fact that there's an inter-task relation for own memory. You can actually transfer own memory from one task to another. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. So, like I said, you can borrow references, and we have um, various static analyses for ensuring safety here. Oh, and one detail about this. You can borrow references to the GC heap. Any kind of borrow that you do of the stack memory or of own memory, you get static assurances that the borrows won't go wrong. If you actually convince the borrow checker that your code makes sense and it says thumbs up, then at least in principle, it means that you're okay and you won't see any dynamic failures. But for the GC heap, we can't, we just, there were attempts to make static rules that would work in many cases, but we found that they were too difficult to use and they didn't cover all the cases you care about. 
So for the GC heap, we just have dynamic enforcement of the borrowing rules. So when you borrow a reference of, of something on the GC heap, there's going to be some dynamic checks, basically like, like write barriers, um, to ensure that you don't do anything too bad to yourself in terms of violating the rules there. So let's get back to methods, because that's what I promised to talk about at some point. So um, here's that struct that we had before, and here's a method on it in Rust. Um, so the way you declare methods in Rust is you don't put them anywhere near the struct definition itself. Instead, you add them in after the fact in separate impl areas or items. And so this is a thing that defines two methods per pair, one that takes that called 0x copy, 0 to x copy, that's going to take in a pair and return a pair. The self keyword here is a special thing signifying that this is a method declaration. It's meant to be the first argument um, for the method definition. And then for replace x, here we're taking ampersand itself. So the important detail here is that since there's no ampersand in the self in the first case for 0 to x copy, it's going to make a copy of the thing that you're calling on. And the copy semantics apply there. Um, versus the replace x method, it's going to borrow the memory that it's being called on, and thus be able to mutate it in place. So by here, if I create a pair with the values 5 and 6, I can make a copy of it with a 0 to x value in p06 there, and I can call replace x on the p temp. And then when I actually do my standard print line, I end up getting, as you might expect, p temp has now 17 for its x field because it was modified in place, but p06 was a copy. This is all pretty straightforward. We have generics too. This is, you know, uh, the bread and butter of functional programmers. Um, so nothing new here. In fact, I think someone else in a talk yesterday was showing off the option type and, you know, the standard sort of thing in terms of having a getter on it that you pass in a default value. Um, I'll just point out the syntax here is that uh, the parametric safe get function is parameterized over t and that binding is expressed via the first set of angle brackets after safe get. And then the uses of t up here in the sig elsewhere in the signature here. Um, okay, so that's nice. So here's actually a concrete example of an interesting, well, a little bit of an interesting program. So I've made this structure here, um, two structs, dollars and euros, for representing um, different kinds of money. And then I've made a trait. Uh, I didn't mention traits before. So um, a trait in Rust is a way of basically defining an interface. It's not really, well, I don't know Scala well enough to say whether it's is or is not a trait like in Scala, but I suspect it's not. Um, it's, it's much like an interface with some caveats. And the point here is that this gives you bounded polymorphism, f-bounded polymorphism, because the trait tells you what methods this type has to support. Whatever implementation of currency we're looking at has to have a render and two euros method for render gives back a string, and two euros gives back a, uh, a, a fresh set of euros. And so add a zero is it's going to take in two instances of some type C, and that type C has to implement the tr currency trait. And then it's going to first convert each of them to euros, and then use their amounts, and add the amounts together to give the total sum. So um, I'm just going to you know make sure that this is totally clear. You implement traits for specific structures. So here's my implementation for dollars. It just formats the, um, the data by putting a dollar sign in front of it. That dollar sign is not meta notation. It's meant to be literally a dollar sign. Uh, great question. Yeah, remember those unique, so I said there were three classes of pointers earlier. The tilde is the way you denote a, uh, a, a class that's like, allocated on the, the exchange heap. So you can think of the tilde string as being an own string that's been allocated on the exchange heap and can be sent to other tasks. Um, there's subtle details about uh, the representation here that I don't want to get to quite yet, but that's the most important thing, is that it's a piece of owned data. But since it's a heap allocated on the exchange heap, you don't need to know how large it is. Because if it weren't uh, passing a string along and you didn't, you didn't use the heap, you'd have to know how to know how much memory to allocate for in your stack if you passed it along. I think Pascal tried this, right, um, in terms of having explicit lengths for all of its uh, character arrays. I, I had, a, in a former life, I was working on a Pascal compiler, um, and I had to deal with that. So the point is that, uh, yeah, that's what that means there. It's just that it's some string that's been allocated on the exchange heap. Good question. So. 
the exchange rate, at least according to Google this morning, was uh, 0.73 uh, dollars per euro. So to convert dollars to euro, it would take the amount of dollars and then, and then multiply it by 0 0.73 and then turn that back into an integer. The as uh, keyword is a cast. It's, it's, it is what it is. Um, I, yeah, I don't want to try to uh, claim it's good or bad. Euros is a much simpler implementation because it's already in euros. And you just have to put the euro um, symbol in front of the format thing there. So um, let's look at a couple examples of this then. If I have a function that actually is, this is the same function I showed you earlier, that's going to take in two instances of currency and add them together. So if I apply this to two instances of euros, any guesses what this produces for 100, 200? Uh, I think 100 plus 200 is what we're looking for here. And so 300 is what I'm hoping to see. And when I ran it, I got 300. OK. So this is a little harder. Dollars, 100 plus 200. Uh, 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 oh, if the exchange rate was 0.73, so uh, there's something there about 2 times 73 and stuff. But let's just find out. This is 219. I believe it. Um, and here's uh, the next one. If I add dollars and euros, so what's this one supposed to be? Any guesses? 270, so let's see what happens. You actually get a type error. Because this is generics, and I said this thing has some type C that's supposed to be the same C in both of the arguments, and you can't do that with dollars and euros. They're different types. That brings us all the way back to what I said originally about what about object-oriented programming. So we do have, this is not object-oriented programming. This is more like ML, which is great when it works, but if you need objects, you have them as well. So to make the way we do objects in Rust right now, at least, and I think it's going to stay that way, is a trait normally is used as a bound, a type. But if you put the trait behind a pointer type, like a pointer sigil like ampersand, what that effectively means is this is actually now a fat pointer. It has a pointer to the data that's being passed as one word, but it has, it's a fat pointer with two words because the second word is a b-table for handling instances of that uh, concrete type that you're being passed. So this gives you object orientation, at least in terms of dynamic dispatch with a method table. So now, now we can actually add two different kinds of currency together using acume euros, which you can see the body is the same as added zeros. The important thing is that I've modified the type signatures slightly to reflect the fact that we're talking about dynamically dispatched object in the second case. This actually runs. Um, correctly now. Okay. So um, that's like a quick, like really fast overview of Rust itself. I wanted to try to jump into an example from C++. It's actually a really sort of terrible example in some ways, but you've got to you know sacrifice sacrifice things when you're um, doing a talk like this in terms of. So if you all see the flaw as we go, it'll be understandable. Um, this is going to be uh, some sort of C++ code where you've got um, cakes and you can eat cakes and there's flavors of cakes, chocolate, vanilla. A cake, you know, when you make it, it's got a flavor and it's got some number of slices on it, and people can eat slices of cake. So I might have a method like birthday cake. This is all C plus plus code. In case you, your eyes aren't deceiving you right now, this is not drug. This is not Rust. Um, so we can make a birthday cake. We can print the status of the birthday cake because um, I need to be able to see what the status of it is in terms of as people eat it. We'll we'll have some method to we'll want some method to eat the entire cake, and then for some reason somebody at some point implemented a method eat at least that says, look, at the return of this method, or this function, um, the cake will have at least count pieces eaten within it. Um, or the cake as it, in its entirety will be gone. For some reason, the person used uh, C++ style cons references. I'm not sure why. Uh, because it's an artificial example, that's why. Um, so same methods as before. I just want to move the signatures up above as I work through this code with you. Eat slice, really simple, right? Just decrement the value. Doesn't get much simpler than that. Um, eat at least, a little bit more difficult. They've got an accumulator here where they're tracking how much they've eaten. They make sure that cake you know, actually has um, more than zero slices, and they uh, they check whether how much they've eaten so far. And then they eat slice, 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 slice until they finally eat enough. Okay, so that's that's all well and good. And then uh, well, eat entire. You know, it turns out I never implemented that, and now somebody wants to use it. So, well, I figure, oh, okay, I, I've got to eat at least method, and I've got my uh, number of slices right there. I, I, 
I've done it, huh? Well, let, let's see. I'll like, test this out now. I've got my, I can make a birthday cake with 16 slices, and I can, you know, make sure it's got 16 slices at the outset. Eat two slices, see how many slices are there, then eat the entire cake and see how many slices are there, then. Now, who knows the joke that I'm about to tell? This code's buggy. Um, it did indeed have 16 slices and then 14 slices, but then it ended up with 7 slices. And the problem is, of course, that it was a total mistake to implement eat entire in terms of eat at least, or at least it was a mistake to do it this way, because we have an aliasing bug. Because I'm passing in the number of slices as a const reference in that argument there, and so every time that it's checking to see how many slices it has, and it compares it and then looks at the threshold as well. The threshold itself is changing. And so its, it's notion of how many slices it needs to eat is going down as it's eating, even though it needed to keep that threshold at the original amount. This is a classic aliasing bug. And the reality here is that you know, that was a stupid example, but aliasing bugs are all too real. And uh, they're a source of major headaches. So we want to make it harder to make these kinds of slight mistakes in Rust. It's not impossible to make. You can still make these mistakes in Rust. You can still express all the great old systems programming hacks you did before and, and bite yourself in the foot or shoot yourself in the foot as you like. Um, but, you know, it's make it harder. In particular, you have to opt in if you want to write unsafe code that will violate the, the, the static checkers guarantees. There's actually a keyword in Rust unsafe for doing so. Okay, so what does the K code look like in Rust? I just wanted to sort of, you know, make sure people double check their thinking about this. It's, it's actually quite similar. There's a flavor with chocolate and vanilla. I've got my number of slices there for the cake that I've created, the structure of the cake. Um, I've got this, you know, very similar methods, birthday cake, the status, you know, eat entire cake, same thing here. I've changed this from being a const reference into being a um, ampersand int. It may look the same as what you thought of in C++, but this now is actually more like a C pointer type, pointer to an int, um, that we're actually going to have to take reference of explicitly. But it still captures the flavor of the earlier code for the most part. It's not quite the same. Constant C++ doesn't have the same semantics as immutable pointer in Rust. Um, but still, this was simpler. This is, this, is, this is you know very much similar to what I wrote before. Decrement the number of slices. This is very much like C++. And this actually is, is quite similar too. I eat so far, the accumulator, and the, you know, the same logic for the most part. The only change I made this code was to get to fit on the slide, I just you know, put these statements in the same line just to get to fit. But it's really the same logic as before. So if you understood the previous code, you can understand this. Okay, and this logic's the same, and the main function's the same. So if I sold you a you know, crazy bill of goods that doesn't actually work, you know, we're, we're, I thought Russ was supposed to fix this problem, but I was able to write all this code. And the answer is, no, of course you can't write this code. The compiler is going to com complain to you. It's going to tell you, you can't do this borrow here of the number of slices of the cake because it's also being borrowed elsewhere. And in particular, it's being borrowed as a mutable thing. You can, you can do multiple borrows of immutable things. Ten things. Yeah. But uh, you can't do a mutable borrow and an immutable borrow that, that, that notices aliasing problems. So this is the bug. It pointed us to the bug. And uh, you actually can easily fix the bug if you make a copy of the number of slices ahead of time and then take reference to that. This compiles fine and runs fine. And of course, that fixes the clickable in C++ as well, but um, that's not the point. The point is that you know, these rules help catch an interesting problem. OK, let me go through concurrency. Um, so like I said, there's something similar to what Erlang's model is here. So we have a stack. And there's a GC heap here, or some sort of automatically managed heap with shared references. And there might be multiple tasks floating around. Um, we're going through some uh, discussions right now. We, we have end-to-end -end style threading where the tasks are meant to be lightweight and then multiplexed onto the system processors. But we also want to support one-to-one -one style um, deployment, if possible, with the same set of standard libraries, or at least as, you know, as common a set of standard libraries as possible. Um, so we're working on that. But the point in here is just that you have separate tasks with separate heaps. And then you've got the exchange heap that I mentioned earlier. So if you do um, an allocation with that tilde sign that I mentioned before, it's on the exchange heap. And then if you want to send it to a different 
um, task, you have some channel that you send it on, and then it gets invalidated on the left hand, the left hand task, and belongs is owned by the right hand task. Okay. Um, I'm going to do the telephone demo just because I thought it was kind of fun, but I don't, don't have too much time for it. Um, so the main thing I want to sort of point out here is that I was looking at the code for, I was looking at some of the examples of Erlang code with, with, with um, buffers and things, where rings of tasks all communicate with each other. It made me start thinking about you know, other interesting kinds of programs, in particular one that where the message you pass along is the 99 bottle, bottles of beer song. And so um, I just want to show you an example run of that program. I'm sorry I don't have the time to walk through the entire piece of code, but um, so if I compile this in my program here and then I run it, you know, our compiler's a little slow. We're working on that too. So the transcripts here, they're actually word tasks, and they're, the interleaving isn't, you know, there's some interleaving of the messages that you see. Um, it's counting down nicely. And the, the funny thing I want to show you is I was thinking to myself, well, you know, when, when some people, when they're singing this song, they just sing it. But other people, they sing it and they, uh, they drink from the bottle at the same time. And so when you do that, that might introduce some entropy into the uh, system. In particular, the act of drinking here I model as introducing some corruption into your byte stream. And just uh, changing one of the bytes, either adding 10 or subtracting 10, depending on a coin flip, essentially. I want to show you what that looks like. Um, because I think it's illustrated with an interesting aspect of Rust. So if I compile, compile this in the entropy configuration, the reason why I'm saying entropy, there's a cute language called entropy that you should look up. It, the, the whole system degrades every operation you do. Um, it's an interesting sort of artistic thinking thing. Um, so that wasn't what I uh, expected. Let me try again. I mean, OK, so first of all, this is doing something interesting. You can see that it's actually degrading the text of the Bottles of Beer song as it goes. But I meant to see a fail. Oh, you know what? I bet it's because my terminals, this, this resolution thing is getting me, I think. Let's try again. OK, so there was some failure. In particular, this was the failure. There was no unsafe code. There were no unsafe blocks in the code I wrote. But failure can still occur. The point is it's controlled. In particular, here, the failure was that um, when you corrupted a byte, you actually ended up with a string that wasn't UTF-8. So when I tried to convert the byte array back to a string, it wasn't properly formatted. And so the system emitted a failure routine and made the task shut itself down in terms of running the structures in the stack um, in a sensible fashion. And then setting all the channels that other tasks are communicating on, communicating on communicating on so that when they receive all those channels, try to send to them, they too will have failures. So you can see a, a failure propagation happening there. I need to talk more with the Erlang folks here to learn more about um, some of the details about the model there. But because I think we have a lot to learn from some of the lessons the Erlang groups have come across. So there's a lot of stuff that I didn't manage to cover in this talk. Um, there's a really interesting I didn't talk at all about lifetimes. So there's actually some syntax we have for explicitly saying what the lifetime is for a particular pointer's scope. And that's the only current source of subtyping in Rust. It's sort of funny. Um, that ties into the borrow check rules that we have. And also, when you have data structures, you actually dynamically freeze them um, depending on what their borrow state is, and then unfreeze them depending to make sure that basically nobody modifies them and to catch that. And finally, um, I mentioned we have closures before. We do have closures, but the ones I showed you only work on the task locally. If you want to make a closure and send it to another task, we have a different form for that um, called one-shot closures, where the keyword is propped, but there's a special syntax for it that's more lightweight. All right, so um, all right, I just wanted to point out that there was a small group of us at Mozilla Research working on Rust. It's Brian Anderson, and Alex Crichton, myself, Nico Matsakis, and Patrick Walton. There's a whole bunch of past interns who have worked on this, another alumni. Great Ward is our special mention because he's the person who um, first invented Rust and was 
worked quite heavily with us on the team for quite a while. Um, and then we have a much larger Rust community that you know I can't possibly name all the members of that. So come and join us. Um, this is fun stuff, and it's really cool. It makes stuff that is efficient. Um, all right, that's all. You mentioned you mentioned the uh, lightweight processes, like uh, that that you can have many uh, the concurrency model and then the graph. So you do user space scheduling, something like that. Uh, we are trying to we that's the end to end versus one to one. I think we do have a user space scheduler or at least a, a library a scheduling library that we have in our standard library that's been implemented to switch between the stacks uh -huh. um, of, of a task, but. There's uh, members of our community who rightfully are saying that there's cases where you know you want to use OS style OS the OS to schedule you, or have more direct control entirely and just you know not be descheduled at all. And they want they want folks to be able to have better control over scheduling stuff. So the answer is there is a user space scheduler. I think at least from one point of view, but um, I don't think we're gonna do, I don't think long term plans to force everyone to be using it. But but you can use to that. And end to end, but end to end, or well, or the goal we hope is to be able to support both one to one and end to end. But this is not an area I'm an expert on. It's entirely honest with you. I'm not sure what other systems I even look to to see how it's done. My my question really is, how do you do preemptive I/O there? If you do end to end, then uh, how do you preemptive stuff? Because it's really difficult. That's why OCaml, for instance, doesn't do that because of the preemption in the system. Well, to be honest with you, we use the libuv library. I don't know if that helps or not. To be honest, I'm not an expert in the I/O subsystem. My impression was that by using libuv, it helped at least some of these kinds of things. Is that true? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know either. Okay. Thank you. Libuv is helpful. It's all event-based, so you have to simulate blocking things if you want them. Um, so this, you might want to have like coroutines that are actually doing, you know, non-blocking. So our current standard library is using libuv everywhere, but again, there's certain members of the community who want to see a version of Rust or a version of our libraries that use the system provided I/O libraries. They want to bypass libuv, but we'll see. I, I, for our purposes, I think libuv serves us well um, for what we're doing right now. Um, so, in the struct example you showed, um, you justify a point struct and then. Um, you said, oh, I've got a mutable X, which is a point struct now, and that limited the, the um, fields in the structure. So is, is, is like the binding is mutable um, the same thing as um, the struct it binds to is mutable? Yeah, yeah, I think I understand your question. So I think the question is, um, I didn't say on the field of the struct that a field was mutable, so how is it that I was mutating fields of the struct? And the answer is that, um, at least in Rust as it stands right now, mutability does not come from the declarations on the fields, but rather is inherited from whoever owns the data at the, at the root of the data structure. So if you declare something as mutable um, in the let binding that you make, it sort of trickles all the way down. And likewise with references, if you take a reference that's mutable, that trickles, trickles down um, through the data, at least the owning portion of that data. It, when, it ha when it starts having references to other data, then obviously it doesn't go across that. It's only for the portion of memory that's actually represented by that block of memory right there. Right, so you can't have a data structure that's partially mutable and partially immutable. We used to have that. We used to have a way to do mutability declarations on fields, but um, it was removed in part because it wasn't clear whether it was buying us enough versus the, the complexity of having to reason about it, um, in a, both in our own type checker and also explaining to users. So right now, we inherit mutability from the declarations, but I think there has been some rumblings of because there's some times when you really want to be able to say, no, no, that's, that's really meant to be immutable. Even, even in a mutable context, that field should be immutable. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so the political question about uh, Firefox. So is this going to land in Firefox? Um, no. Uh, the goal, or, well, the goal is to make a new web browser. Um, 
So uh, there is some people who have been, so we use LLVM as our backend. And the reason why I mentioned that is because now there's this asm.js thing where you can um, use LLVM to target asm.js. So there has been talk among some people of trying to make Rust a new language for programming the JavaScript parts of things by targeting asm.js via LLVM. But that's the only way that I can see it being part of Firefox in any sense right now. I don't think that code base would be moving to this. Instead, the, because the goal is not to take existing Firefox code en masse and just try to you know, port it bit by bit to Rust. The idea is to innovate and make new algorithms for like uh, parallel CSS electron matching and things like that that I don't know very much about um, to do new things. My question is about uh, the modern version. Is it means that you freeze in this kind of experimenting that you do in Rust, or you keep continuing this kind of innovation daily basis? I think that the right answer there is that for 1.0, the goal is not to stop innovating. The goal is to fix a subset of the language that we are willing to say to our users, you can program to this subset, and we will either continue to support it, or we will provide you a tool for forward porting the way like I think Go format or something like that. They have some tool for porting between versions of Go. Um, but certainly, the, we do not want to stop innovating. There's plenty of things that we need to improve upon. And so our current strategy for that is every piece of the system that's at all questionable right now, we have under what we call feature guards. So if you want to opt in using anything like uh, user-defined macros whose semantics or syntax might change post 1.0, we're just putting feature guards and all these things so that you as the user have to understand you're using something that you might have to do something to fix later on and we can't promise you won't have to think about later. Um, which I think is a pretty nice sweet spot to hit in terms of giving us still the ability to 